Hi, so as I've just been introduced, my name is David Anderson. I'm an intensivist from the Alfred. I'm a medical donation specialist with Donate Life Victoria. And I'd like to start my talk with some bad news. We're all going to die. I'm sorry if that comes as a surprise to some of you, as it might, but it is an inevitability. And it is just as inevitable for our patients as it is for us. So I would like to give my little 15-minute talk as a little potpourri of advice from my point of view about how I deliver end-of-life care in the ICU and about how we deliver end-of-life care in Alfred Health. I am somewhat intimidated because of the other names on the bill and because I look around the audience and see many people who've been delivering end-of-life care in the ICU for a lot longer than I have. However, I hope we can all learn something from each other today. This is a um, conference on quality and safety. And I'm not going to say too much about safety. Dying may or may not be a safe event, but it can be a quality event. Um, the, um, in terms of quality, why should we be worried about quality of dying? Dead people, by and large, do not fill in satisfaction surveys. We should be worried for three reasons, I think. We should be worried as humans that we are providing patients with an experience that is as free of suffering as possible. We should be worried as clinicians that we are providing the right care for the right patients and not bringing patients to ICU who are destined to die. And I guess this fits in with you know, many of the other talks in this conference will be about MET calls and rapid response calls, and many of you will be aware of the statistic that a, a large proportion of MET calls are made up of patients who are destined to die. Um, and finally, we should be worried because of this quote by uh, Dame Cicely Saunders, the founder of the hospice movement, that how people die remains in the memory of those who live on. We, what we do in the ICU has a lasting effect on survivors of ICU and families of loved ones who die in ICU. Um, this is our core business. A third of people admitted to the IC sorry, a third of people are admitted to the ICU in the last 30 days of their life. This is American data published in JAMA just last week. It's probably slightly less in Australia and New Zealand, but I imagine not much less. Of the patients who come into your ICU, this is ANZIC's core data, 8% of them will die. If you remove the bed and breakfast HDU patients coming for post-op monitoring, that number goes up significantly. So we deal with dying as much as any other specialty. Importantly, the way people die in ICU is very different, and almost all patients in ICU in Australia and New Zealand die following a planned withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. I, um, I practiced this talk last week on some visitors to our ICU from China and they were particularly shocked at that last statistic because they said in China it's the other way around. Almost everyone dies on full support and one of the common modes of death in China is the family running out of money to pay for treatment. Um, so the talk that I'm going to give for us as a global community is unique to us in Australia and New Zealand, but I consider myself a bit of an evangelist to try and get the word out that I think we're doing things quite well here. So I'm going to break the talk down into the way I approach dying and therefore the way, of course, I think everyone else should. And the first thing I think that we have to do is diagnose dying, which sounds easy, but it's not. I think it's possibly easier for us as the intensive care community to diagnose dying. Sometimes it's quite obvious for us. If someone's on 100 mics a minute of NORAD and has a lactate of 20 and their fingers and toes are all falling off, they're probably dying. But what about the patient who's on their third admission this year for COPD? Are they dying? What about the patient who is coming to us following a further fistula revision for end-stage renal disease who can't leave the house? Are they dying? That's when it becomes less clear. Some clarity can be gained from this very famous description of, in, in the BMJ about 10 years ago of death trajectories by Murray. And this was aimed at um, community doctors at GPs. This was the, the patients who died in a GP practice each year. This was how they died. I have taken the liberty of, of adding Anderson's modification to Murray's death trajectories for us in intensive care. But basically, when most people think of dying, they think of the blue line. They think of cancer, someone who's functionally normal and has a fairly smooth, predictable decline towards death over months and years. Um, that's not what we see in ICU by and large. We see the, the purple line, mainly, the chronic illnesses, COPD, CHF, chronic kidney disease. 
These are illnesses that are, punctu that are a gradual decline punctuated by exacerbations of acute episodes which the patient will normally get better from, however not quite get back to where they were before, and we don't know where on the trajectory that they are. And we often think they're much further along the trajectory than their parent teams do. The green line is the line that worries me the most. The physical and cognitive frailty. These are the patients with dementia. These are the frail patients. These are patients who, when many of us started our careers, would never have got near the door of an ICU. And increasingly, they are. And I, I did my fellowship for a year in Canada. And sometimes a third of the patients in the ICU were these severely demented, frail patients who were close to death, but who were admitted to ICU because if we didn't admit them, the family would sue. That's a very sad state of affairs that I hope we never get to in Australia or New Zealand. And finally, of course, critical illness. The patients that we think we're trained to deal with in ICU, the patients who are normal one day and dead the next, who are, if you reflect on it, a tiny minority of what we do. So diagnosing death is important, but it's hard, and that's the first stage in the, own, in, in the process of providing quality end-of-life care in the ICU. The next stage is communicating your diagnosis, your prognosis, and your plan to the family. And this is something we think we're very good at, and perhaps we're not quite as good as we think we are. This is research from... Um, from the group in Washington at the University of Washington who study a lot of um, work around ICU family meetings. And what they've shown is that families feel that they should be listened to and feel more satisfied with any outcome if they feel listened to. Doctors think we're good communicators. We're not. We're actually just good talkers. And all that we do is tell the family things and we by and large don't ask and don't listen. And this is an observation time and again. Something we've done at Alfred Health to try to improve the quality of communication for all of our patients and families is to start at the start. We accept that the orthopaedic surgeons are beyond help and we go and work on the interns instead. Um, and um, this, is a, a, this is me facilitating a family meeting workshop with a group of interns at Alfred Health. So we had an actor, we had a social worker, we had scenarios, this was ward-based family meetings, but to teach them the principles of having a family meeting using the spikes um, um, acronym that some of you may be familiar with, but basically it involves setting the scene, finding out what they know, giving medical information, eliciting information about values, and putting it all together, pretty much the way we would do most family meetings. I think it's important to note that this meeting was done out of hours, unpaid time, and it was oversubscribed. People want to learn this, and, and we in the intensive, this was done in conjunction with palliative care in our hospital, but we do just as much of this as palliative care do. This, this should be our core business to evangelize about this. What we want to avoid is this. The whole point of our communication training is to, I think, engage in, uh, engage in a process of shared decision making with family members. And I just want to spend a tiny bit of time on that because many intensivists, many doctors who've been around a while recoil somewhat at the thought of shared decision making because they think that this is shared decision making. It's giving the family a bewildering menu of options and saying, pick one. That's not shared decision making. Shared decision making is you as the experienced clinician picking from the options that you think will work if there's more than one option, offering those to the family or the patient, finding out what kind of patient the person is, so sorry, finding out what kind of person the patient is, so establishing their values and preferences, and then based on your medical knowledge and the family's knowledge of the patient's values, putting that together into your recommendation, which most of the time the family will accept. That's shared decision making and it's often done very poorly because people just think, as I say, it's offering them the menu. So that's what we hope to improve. One worry I have about shared decision making is that shared decision making with millennials might not work. So we're used to dealing with baby boomer patients and for most patients in our ICU, they want doctor knows best. So this was a survey where someone with a clipboard went round the hospital, found a bunch of patients and said, if you were really sick, who would you want to make decisions for you? And most patients, two-thirds of patients said, I want the doctor to decide, they're the doctor. And one-third of patients said they wanted shared decision-making. When young family members were asked, more than half of them said, I don't care what the doctor says, I'm going to go on Google and find out myself, and I will decide. So this is a bit of a, a worry for us in the future going forward, that the current kind of ethically sound process of shared decision-making may not work on people who feel that you know, who live in the post-truth the post era, I guess, who feel that, you know, they can find any information they want on the internet and professionals aren't to be trusted. So a bit of a cautionary tale. Um, I want to just share an example of how shared decision-making and even maybe a little bit of paternalism might still be useful. 
This is one of my favorite slides of all time. This is a screen grab from the original trial in 1961 in JAMA that described CPR. This was from the section on indications and contraindications for CPR, and I'm just going to read it. Not all dying patients should have cardiopulmonary resuscitation attempted. Some evaluation should be made before proceeding. The cardiac arrest should be sudden and unexpected. The patient should not be in the terminal stages of a malignant or other chronic disease, and there should be some possibility of a return to functional existence. Where did we go wrong? When did CPR go from being a treatment that we could prescribe to a societal expectation? Well, partly we went wrong ourselves along the journey by offering it to everyone without thinking about the consequences. So I think it's time for us to take a step back. So just to use CPR as an example of how I might communicate a treatment that I don't want someone to have, I think about a model, and I think about this model in particular for CPR that was devised by Barbara Hayes, who's an ethicist and palliative care physician here in Melbourne. And basically, with CPR, or perhaps with any treatment, the, right, the first thing to ask yourself is, will the treatment work in this patient? So to give you an example, I admitted a patient to the ICU last week um, with a bowel obstruction who had an ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction 15%, NYHA class 4 symptoms, couldn't leave the house. Will this man survive CPR? In my opinion, no. If this man arrests, he will not survive resuscitation. Therefore, it's simple. I go down the line on the left. Is he dying? No, he's not dying. But he's medically unwell. So I sat down with the patient and his daughter and told them what we were going to do and told them why we wouldn't be doing CPR, and they accepted that. There was no questions involved. They were, I was getting assent for my plan of treatment. So that is a bit paternalistic, but I think sometimes an appropriate way to discuss a treatment that people might expect. This model has been translated in many hospitals into a, a goals of care form. And, and you, you can't, you know, many people will say you can't change behavior through a form. However, I saw out in the poster area someone's trying and seems to have succeeded. There's a poster basically showing that you can change behavior using a form similar to this. Um, changing the conversation from the intern handing them a piece of paper. And I have seen interns do this. I've seen a junior doctor hand a resuscitation form to a family and ask them to fill it in. Um, to having a conversation about what are your goals and then based on those goals, filling in what we think is medically appropriate so that we no longer have the utterly baffling uh, for CPR but not for intubation or ICU, which still pops up occasionally when the old forms are used. So I encourage those of you who haven't already to transition from having a conversation about not for resus to having a conversation about goals of care. I have to touch briefly on organ donation because it's my job and also because it's Donate Life Week to talk about a couple of initiatives that we've, up, that we've used at Alfred Health to improve our um, uptake of organ donation, but more importantly to ensure that patients have their wishes carried out at the end of their life. What we want is for someone who wants to be an organ donor to be an organ donor and someone who doesn't want to be an organ donor to not be an organ donor and for their family to be happy with that decision going forward. Um, this is a, a national... Um, uh, policy by Donate Life, but we've managed to, um, partly by subterfuge and partly just by consensus of our intensivists, introduce it at the Alfred um, with reasonable success. So the first thing we've done is routine referral. Every single patient who dies in our ICU is referred to Donate Life. It doesn't matter if they're 102, it doesn't matter if they're dying of lymphoma, it doesn't matter if they died with a needle hanging out of their arm. Every single patient who dies in our ICU is referred to Donate Life. The reason for that is threefold. One is that it allows us to do a registry check, which means if the patient is not medically suitable, we can go to the family and as part of our end of life conversation say, um, by the way, Joe had said that he wanted to be an organ donor, but he can't because he's not medically suitable. Because we know that families who had never have organ donation mentioned often are waiting for us to ask about it. The second reason is that as intensivists at the bedside, we're actually not very good at assessing who's medically suitable. So we have a centralized process in Victoria run by four very senior specialists who decide on who's medically suitable and pass that information back. The third reason, and I think the most important, is that if we refer everyone, we won't forget about the 18-year-old who's dying of a TBI, even if we have to refer the 90-year-old with lymphoma. The other thing we do is collaborative requesting, which is that every request for organ donation should, um, as well as the bedside intensivist, have someone who's completed the practical family donation conversation course, which in our institution is usually one of our senior donation nurses, occasionally another physician who's done the course. So I just want to touch very briefly before I finish on how we manage symptoms in our ICU. The common symptoms in ICU should come as no surprise to you, except the one second from last, which is one that always bothers me, which is thirst. And it never occurred to me until I 
read this article about symptoms in ICU and thought, gosh, it must be quite uncomfortable to die with a sodium of 160. So just remember, mouth care is important. We manage um, symptoms using two strategies. One is a symptom observation chart, which is used throughout our hospital. And we don't use it on all patients in the ICU because some of our patients die quite quickly after withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. But if someone lingers on a little bit, the nurses will start using this chart. Instead of measuring observations, they will assess symptoms and grade them on severity and titrate treatments to that. So this has been quite a successful initiative. The other thing we have are these um, multicolored uh, flow sheets, which provide, are a aiming to provide empowerment to the bedside nurse to titrate treatments to effect and guidance for the junior doctors who are prescribing those treatments. We have them for pain management, management of shortness of breath, which is all opioid based, giving guidance on dosages and particularly around titrating to effect, which I think is something we're not as good at in ICU as palliative care physicians are. A bit around agitation, the use of this is, this is a way of encouraging people not just to start 10 and 10 M&M &M as their standard palliative care regimen, but to titrate treatments and different treatments to effect. And finally, just giving guidance around other symptoms at end of life. And finally, it's important for us to remember that our duty to the family carries on after death in terms of offering bereavement to families who may have complicated grief. That was a wild tour de force. I just want to come back to where I started, which was talking about quality with another quote, again, one of my favorites. This was by a judge when asked to review the status of intensive care in the United Kingdom in the 80s. And he said, the success of intensive care is not to be measured by the statistics of survival as though each death were a medical failure. It's to be measured by the quality of lives preserved or restored, the quality of the dying of those whose interest it is to die, and the quality of the human relationships involved in each death. Quality of dying is part of what we do, and that can be summarized even more by the father of intensive care. Death is not the enemy, but occasionally needs help with the timing. Thank you. <laughs>